Hello, my name is uh, Jacques Doysens, and I'm a professor in Leuven in Belgium, but I also cooperate with uh, two Brazilian colleagues mentioned here on the slide, Felipe Carpes and Arturo Forner Cordero. In my talk, I will explain how you can study walking, tripping and falls in the elderly in a safe laboratory environment, and I will make the point that to understand these issues of falls and uh, perturbations, you need to have a good grasp of the basics of the neural control of gait and perturbations. So let me start by pointing out that in daily life, uh, walking can be very dangerous, especially for the elderly. Uh, you can see here uh, examples of an older uh, subject uh, walking uh, over the street and you will appreciate that in the street there are these holes, there are uneven pavements, uh, so there are plenty of opportunities for tripping and stumbling. And even at home, you see on the right side here, uh, at the home there are all these uh, imminent dangers, for example, these wires that are dangling on the floor can cause tripping. But also, as you see at the bottom there, uh, sometimes the danger is that uh, the surfaces are not at the same height and people uh, they uh, step on unexpected heights and they can lose their balance that way. Actually, I have a, a rather famous example of this in the next uh, in the next picture. It's a series of pictures instead of the video, but what the video uh, shows is a part of a news uh, of the news about uh, Castro giving a speech. And after the speech, he comes down the stairs, and just the last stairs, he misses the stair and he falls in public. Just to illustrate you uh, that the elderly face these sorts of problems, of course, much more than young people, and this has to do also with the fact that their vision is less good than in the young uh, subjects. Now, uh, in my research over the many years that I've uh, spent in my career now on locomotion, uh, I've tried to bring these uh, experiments, these situations uh, where people trip and fall and so on in the laboratory. And uh, this is shown in the next uh, part here where uh, you're, you can imagine a video showing an elderly person walking towards this platform but this platform can be lowered uh, at a given point. So uh, this can be done unexpectedly. So the people uh, perform what I would call the Castro experiments. They step on a surface that is actually lower than what they expect it to be. And uh, what is shown in the video is that this makes them almost fall. Uh, in any case, they, uh, they lose their balance. But of course, in the laboratory, we have people to, that will uh, catch these subjects, so none of the subjects ever f uh, really fell. So this is the uh, type of experiments that we have been doing in the lab. And as you can see uh, in detail more in this picture here, the uh, idea is to really control the uh, experiment by uh, having EMG by having a recording of the muscle activity and also there's a force plate underneath so that we can measure the forces during the experiment and we measure of course also the kinematics that means we can also uh, look at in detail at the movements being performed. We have done this also for experiments in which we have obstacles and we use, for example, the setup as is shown here, in which you see a treadmill and you see an obstacle. And at a given point, this obstacle is dropped on the treadmill and it advances towards the subjects. And the subjects try to avoid these obstacles. And they can do this in two ways. What you see on the left side is that they try to avoid it by making one big step. This is what you see, especially in early swing. Uh, what you see is that the subjects see the obstacle and they make a big uh, step over the obstacle. So it's actually an exaggeration of the swing phase, if you like. This is in contrast to the other strategy they can use. And this happens uh, mainly when the obstacle is dropped in the late swing phase. What you see here is a very different reaction. Uh, it's not so clear maybe, but I have another slide coming up showing it more clearly. What is happening here is that this obstacle is dropped in the late swing phase and the subjects put their feet 
uh, on the on the treadmill first and in a second movement they then go over the obstacle so the first movement is actually the foot being put down so it's uh, in contrast to what we saw on the left side where people have an elevation here they put the foot down and then step over the obstacle in a second movement this is schematically and perhaps more clearly shown in this uh, picture here where you see again these two uh, these two avoidance strategies the long step and the short step and what you can see here in the early swing phase is that people uh, they uh, they see the obstacle and they go over the obstacle in one go in a long step in this case you can more clearly see that they put the feet down in front of the uh, in the of the obstacle and then after they have put the foot down they then go over the obstacle in a second movement so we call this the short step strategy a short step because they make a short step here to put the foot down we have also done experiments in which we uh, simulate what is happening when people trip young and old people were invited to step on a treadmill and what this video basically would show is that the uh, subjects uh, they uh, hit the obstacle and then they stumble they make a trip and they step then over the obstacle and again what is happening here is that they can do this in two ways very similar to what I described earlier here you see that there is contact made in the early swing phase and as a result the foot is lifted over the obstacle in one go so it's a long step if you like and uh, in this tripping of in this tripping condition uh, the trip occurs in the late swing phase and what you see in this case is that they make a short step similar to what i just showed you the foot is put down and then uh, in a second movement uh, is lifted over the obstacle so basically these are the reactions that you can observe in young and in older subjects uh, in laboratory environment and it allows you to study uh, in detail how these reactions occur now the point i want to make in this webinar is that it pays off to uh, first have a good idea of the basics of gates and of the neural control of gait to understand these reactions so i will come to i'll come back to the stumbling and to the obstacle avoidance uh, near the end of the talk and i hope at that point you will be ready to understand much better why we see these short steps and these long steps so uh, in the first part i will go to the basics the basics of uh, of gait and the neural control of basic of of gait and I will do so by having, uh, by going back to uh, the uh, uh, the history uh, of the beginning of the analysis of gate. And in the second part, we will return back to these perturbed gates. So uh, let's start with uh, simply explaining you what we mean by gate and by the gate cycle. In the gate cycle, we have two basic parts. Uh, there is a part which we call the stance phase in which the foot is on the ground as you can see here on the left and this is this is the phase that starts with the heel strike and that is uh, finished uh, with the push off the second part we call the swing phase that's when the limb is off the ground uh, there is a flexion movement as you can see here and then uh, there is a swing period of the ground and then near the end of the swing phase you see that the foot is lower, lowered again and put on the surface or on the treadmill uh, below here you see that this uh, sequence of events can take place because there is a sequential activation of a variety of muscles in the leg and it is the task of the central nervous system to create this pattern of activity in these various muscles as is illustrated in this figure i will start by uh, s stating something about the uh, symbol gate and one of the amazing and interesting features of uh, gate of simple gate is that it can be done as is shown here uh, in combination with many other things so it's a, it, it's really possible especially for young people to perform this task of walking 
uh, on what I would call an automatic pilot. Uh, this young man is texting uh, heavily while at the same time walking in the street. And as I promised, I would go back to the history. Uh, I would like to start my story by pointing out that the, the start of the gate analysis was actually uh, coincided with the uh, with the advent of photography for the first time when it became possible to photograph movement that's when it became possible to analyze these movements in detail uh, this picture that i show here is from mabridge a photographer in the united states that has been mo uh, uh, looking at uh, movements of, diff of various animals and also of humans and this work, uh, similar work occurred in, in Europe, allowed some neuroscientists to then start to think about the step cycle. And the first thing they did is descriptive. This uh, Philipson is a Belgian scientist actually, that more than a century ago started by describing in detail the step cycle as I just explained to you. And he subdivided it in a, in a number of parts. Uh, the swing phase and the stance phase of course but within the swing phase he made a distinction between what he called the f phase f for flexion which is the phase where the limb is flexed and uh, this was followed by what is called what he called the e1 phase which is the first extension phase this is the period when the animal or the human uh, s s uh, extend the leg uh, in preparation of landing the landing touchdown is then the start of the next phase which is the, the beginning of the stance phase or the beginning of the e2 phase the e2 phase nowadays is also often called the loading phase this is the phase where the limb is loaded the animal is loaded uh, and this uh, this phase uh, is the support phase and is followed by finally the push off because uh, in most cases the gait is forward so the animal or the human is pushed forward in the final phase the e3 phase uh, the late the last part of the uh, of the stance phase and then the cycle starts again because then there is uh, the swing phase again and the stance phase and so on it's a repetitive movement now one of the first questions these uh, people asked is what uh, part of the central nervous system is actually involved in these movements and uh, as you see on this graph the uh, brain the central nervous system cons consists of a brain uh, with a brain stem and then there is a spinal cord and so uh, one of the striking first things that these uh, people observed and of course what we all know is that uh, even uh, the presence of the spinal cord by itself is sufficient to generate locomotion and gait and the uh, example that you all know for sure is the uh, example of the chicken without head as is shown here uh, that is known to make some steps even after the head is off the neck and in this particular picture i show here on the right uh, it's the picture of the Mike, the headless chicken. That was a chicken that survived for 18 months and was able to walk uh, without a head. So the first lesson these people learned and we learned is that locomotion, basic locomotion, simple locomotion can be generated uh, by the spinal cord. And so then the question was asked, how does the spinal cord achieve this? And the first answers given to that by these early scientists like Sherrington and Philipson was that uh, basically gait, simple gait, uh, consists of a chain of reflexes. What is a chain of reflexes? Let me turn to an example of a chain reaction that you all know. Uh, this is a chain reaction, uh, a collision of uh, multiple vehicles and it is caused by the first car that has to stop abruptly and this action then has an action on the second car which also has to stop abruptly and the third and so on so this is a chain reaction and basically what Philipson and Sherrington claimed is that gait is also a chain of reaction let me explain this by showing you the original graph of the thesis of Philipson it's in French but I will uh, help you through it uh, this is the step cycle 
with the, diff the various phases that Philipson defined, as I just explained, the F phase and then the E1 phase and the E2 phase and the E3 phase. And uh, superimposed here are the various reflexes that these people thought were linked to these phases. And to start with the first one, uh, the F phase, for them the flexion phase, it was basically caused by what is called the flexion reflex. And what is a flexion reflex? It's something that has been known for a long time, even long before Philipson and Sherrington, even from the time of Descartes, it was known that when there is a painful stimulus, like a fire, uh, for example, then uh, when touching the fire, the normal reaction is a withdrawal of the feet from this fire, and the withdrawal of the feet can be caused by a flexion in the whole limb, not just in the foot, but also in the knee and in the hip, a flexion of the limb, the withdrawal reflex. And so the idea, the basic idea of these early scientists like Sherrington was that the muscles uh, that uh, cause this flexion are the same muscles that are active in the swing phase. So basically the flexion reflex and the swing phase the flexion part of the swing phase are basically the same according to them because uh, what they found, what Sherrington found, is that the muscles that are involved in these actions in the flexion uh, reflex but also in the swing phase uh, flexion part, they are the sa exactly the same muscles. So basically uh, the idea was that in the spinal cord there is some sort of a burst generator, a flexor burst generator that activates the motor neurons of these various muscles, all flexors, and this could give rise to either the flexor reflex or it could give rise to the beginning of the swing phase. Now this story is not complete yet because there is not only uh, the flexor part of the story. Uh, all these muscles, this is all uh, a drawing again from the work of Sherrington. Uh, Sherrington also found that there is another group of muscles, uh, muscles that are uh, basically uh, on the other side. Uh, basically these are the extensors. The extensors are the muscles that uh, will extend the limb. The flexors flex, the extensors extend the limb against gravity. And so, if you want to have a flexion of the limb, it's not sufficient to just activate the flexors, because uh, you also need to relax the extensors. If the extensors are still active at that time, you will have no flexion. So a flexion reflex basically consists of two things. It consists of an activation of the flexors, and at the same time, a suppression of the extensors. So in this schematic, this now shows as follows. The flexor burst generator has to activate flexors, but at the same time it has to inhibit, it has to suppress the extensor motor neurons. So then they thought that uh, there were more reflexes coming in, uh, in the chain of reflexes, and uh, basically Philipson and Sherrington they thought that the end of the swing phase, the E1 phase, was basically a crossed extensor reflex because at the same time uh, there was flexion in the crossed limb, in the contralateral leg, and it, it was also long known that the flexion reflex on one side and one leg is accompanied by an extension of the other leg. Uh, this basically makes sense because if you want to withdraw, for example, uh, the foot from this painful stimulus here, uh, it makes sense to flex that limb, but at the same time there is a support needed and the support can be provided by extending the, uh, the other leg, so that's the crossed uh, extensor reflex. And basically they thought that this crossed extensor reflex was causing the uh, E1 phase. And then at the end of the, uh, this E1 phase, the limb is put on the ground, and then the stance phase starts, and then they thought that the contact with the ground was the stimulus for an yet another reflex, uh, a reflex causing the extension. And this is also a reflex that was known already at the time, and that is well studied still today, 
It's called the extensor trust. And what is the extensor trust? Well, if you hold an animal like is shown on the left side here, a dog, in the air, and now you put it gently down on the, on the table, it will soon extend the limb as soon as contact is made with this table. And the same happens with a newborn if you have uh, a baby, better, if you have a baby and you put it on the, on the table, uh, it will also extend the leg and this is called the extensor trust. So basically uh, what Philipson and Sherrington thought was that the extension that you see in the stance phase, that's the same as this reflex, this extensor trust. This uh, has meanwhile been uh, elaborated on and in our own work we have been able to identify the uh, receptors involved in this extensor trust and we were able some years ago to demonstrate that the receptors involved are receptors like is shown here these are load receptors load receptors are the ones are the receptors that can signal the loading of the limb after touching the ground and these tendon organs uh, are activated uh, when these muscles then contract and what is shown here in these experiments that we did a long time ago is that when you activate these Golgi tendon organs in the extensors you produce the extra uh, force in the extensors that's what you see here so that is a reinforcing reflex the uh, there is a loading of the extensors and as a result of that there is extra extension and at the same time you can see that the rhythmic bursts that normally occur in IF this is for the ipsilateral flexors these regular bursts do disappear so there is a suppression of the flexor activity and there is a prolongation of the extensor activity So here we are uh, now complete for the various uh, reflexes that were thought to be involved in the gait cycle and uh, nowadays we have still this, this notion, There's, this is still a valid notion except that we learned some new items now about these uh, reflexes and so let me summarize what we learned in more than a century of uh, work on this matter. Uh, the idea that the flexor reflex is the same as the flexion phase of the swing is still valid and it has been confirmed by the group of Lundberg and many of his colleagues with intracellular techniques, so very sophisticated neurophysiological techniques have basically confirmed this notion that these early workers had. So the flexor reflex uses the same sort of circuitry. The cross extensor reflex idea has been left out uh, in more recent uh, work and we now believe that the end of the swing phase this uh, first extension phase is more the result of a passive pendulum action so the, the leg is, uh, is swung forward and because of gravity and inertia the limb then is extending at the end of the swing phase until it touches the ground and as soon as it touches the ground the limb is loaded and then we have indeed the extensor trust reflex and we now know as I told you before that this is related to activation of load receptors in the extensors and then we are at the end of the cycle because at the end of the cycle there is less of an um, uh, activation of these load receptors which means there is also less inhibition of the flexors and so the flexor reflex can then start again still questionable though is how we come to the fact that this cycle repeats itself time and time over again. So this was a question that was already posed by these early workers in, in more than a century ago and uh, they came up with some interesting ideas on this as well. This is the cover of this thesis of uh, Philipson and this is a picture uh, in that uh, thesis uh, showing an uh, experiment that I did with a dog that they had transected the spinal cord so the, this is spinalized uh, dog if you like and what they found is that even after cutting the dorsal uh, cutting the spinal cords of this dog it was still possible to elicit these movements, these rhythmic movements of the legs as shown here 
And this sort of uh, introduced the idea that maybe there was some sort of a clock, a sort of an oscillator within the spinal cord that caused this repetitive, this rhythmic activation uh, causing this sequence of steps. Uh, Sherrington was a little critical of this idea because he said, well, this still doesn't prove that there is an oscillator because these movements uh, may again represent a chain of reflexes. Uh, each movement induces the next movement and it's still a chain. So the question was left open uh, for a while, but only for a brief while, because a third scientist appeared on the scene and this guy, uh, this new researcher was Graham Brown. And Graham Brown was going to solve this, uh, this question. And how did he do that? Well, let me show you first the reflex arc. Uh, all the reflexes that I described have a reflex arc. That means that they start with a stimulation of receptors. And then the sensory activity travels to the spinal cord over the dorsal roots to make contact then with the motor neurons over some reflex pathway as is shown here. And here we see the motor neuron with its contacts to the muscles. So a stimulus given to a receptor over the spinal cord results in a reflex and, and a reflex activation of a set of muscles. That's a reflex. So Graham Brown, Brown wanted to tackle this question about whether reflexes could explain these movements of the spinal dog and so the experiment that he did is that he cut the dorsal roots here uh, to, to then open up the reflex loop so to speak so this would eliminate all the reflexes and if still rhythmic activity persisted this would prove that there was indeed some sort of an oscillator the oscillator he termed the central pattern generator for locomotion and also this work is more than a century old as you can see here but it definitely showed that uh, locomotion has to take into account this element not only of the chain of reflexes but that there is also something called a central pattern generator within the spinal cord generating these uh, uh, rhythmic bursts of activity it has to be added, however, that uh, the uh, rhythm that, can, that one can see in these animals with cut dorsal roots was not really normal. You can see here how the pattern degenerated. Here you see there still is rhythmic activity, but it's grossly abnormal. And this shows that the oscillator by itself, the pattern generator, is not sufficient. What you really need is an interaction between reflexes, sensory input, and this pattern generator. And this pattern generator needs this input because it has to know when to switch from one phase to the other phase. To give you an example, if you walk uphill or if you walk with a large amount of load, your stance phase is going to be much longer and your swing phase will be shortened. An oscillator by itself cannot decide about it. It can only be decided in interaction with these load receptors and that is uh, why these load receptors have such potent action on the central pattern generators and they can uh, cause a switch to the uh, swing phase which is appropriate. So making the stance phase appropriately long when you go uphill or when you're carrying a heavy load. So this is now where it stands. What we now believe is that locomotion is supported by some sort of chain of reflexes in interaction with a central oscillator. And that is the current view. And the, uh, the afferent activity is absolutely essential for the phase transitions, uh, the phase transitions in the cycles. So this is basically now what you need knowing about the basics of gait. And now I think we're ready to tackle the second part of this talk, which is about perturbed gait. And I will deal with perturbed gait in the young population, but also in elderly uh, subjects, because this is quite relevant in the topic of uh, falls and stumbling, and uh, in the elderly, a topic that is very relevant nowadays with the uh, graying of the populations everywhere in the world. Let me first start by uh, one notion that is quite important uh, to understand perturbed gait, 
and that is that the uh, moment of the perturbation in the step cycle is of crucial importance. To illustrate that, let me here illustrate the what happens in two cases. One, uh, imagine that you have uh, some sort of stimulus, a painful stimulus, that will cause withdrawal of the limb, uh, flexor reflex, and imagine that this would happen at the end of the stance phase and when you are about to swing uh, the limb forward, uh, there will be normally a flexion movement, so uh, the flexor reflex at that point is very appropriate <coughs> and it should be facilitated in fact. But if you would have exactly the same stimulus near the end of the swing phase when you're about to put the foot down, then it's a very different story because if you, at that point you would then withdraw the leg, if you would have a flexion uh, movement, it could cause you to fall because this is uh, the wrong uh, period to flex the limb. The limb is in fact now uh, to extend to uh, be uh, able to support the body. So it makes sense that the central nervous system takes this into account and the interesting fact is that uh, some years ago uh, it could be proven that the spinal cord is already able to perform this type of police action if you like. What you see here is from work of uh, Forsberg and the colleagues in the laboratory of uh, Stan Grillner showing uh, what happens in an animal that has a spinal cord transected when you give it a stimulus which causes a flexion reflex. And it causes this flexion reflex when the stimulus is given in the early swing phase. But then if you give the same stimulus later and later in the step cycle, you see that the response gets smaller and smaller. And when the stimulus is given near the end of the swing phase, in the late swing phase, there is just this no response left. So this is what they called a phase-dependent reflex modulation. The response is function of the timing of the stimulation within the step cycle. And that's a very important notion. And it makes, of course, a lot of sense to organize it in this way. And the way we think about it is that the, again, the generator for the flexor burst uh, not only provides the excitation to the flexor motor neurons and, of course, the inhibition to the extensors, but at the same time, it opens or closes the uh, gates, if you like, for the activity that is coming into the system. So normally there is a stream of activity coming over what is called the flexor reflex afferent pathway, and this pathway is opened in early stance, in early uh, swing, excuse me, ES, but it is closed in the late swing. So near the end of the swing phase, uh, this pathway is closed and this explains why you don't see any uh, reaction at the end of the swing phase and you see a large reaction in the early swing phase. So this is a very meaningful, uh, meaningful control. This is of course animal research and most of you will uh, primarily be interested in what's happening to the human. So uh, let's switch to humans. And let me first uh, make one point, and that is that uh, the question was raised whether humans uh, use the same sort of neural control as these animals that were studied by these researchers I mentioned before. And um, some years ago, uh, in 98, I made a review of all the evidence and I came up with the conclusion, yes, uh, the spinal cord in the human must contain also a, uh, a central pattern generator for locomotion. And actually one of the nicest pieces of evidence in favor of that is shown here. It's uh, just a newborn uh, baby that is held in uh, the air and then put on, uh, on, on this uh, table. And as soon as they make contact, you can see uh, a form of walking. So rhythmic stepping is something that is already present in the newborn, despite the fact that in this stage there is no mature connection between the brain and the, and the spinal cord. So the descending pathways from the cortex are not yet uh, fully operational, yet it is possible to elicit walking and that's a good 
uh, evidence, that's good evidence to show that, in the, that the spinal cord of these babies do contain spinal cord, uh, spinal pattern generators for locomotion. Next question is whether for these uh, reflex modulations, uh, one can also make the point that this is also something that is happening in humans. And some years ago, we tried to, to find out the answer to that in experiments in which we applied a stimulus in various phases of the swing phase. In this stippled line is the stimulus, and this arrow here is the touchdown. And you see that when the stimulus is given early in the swing phase, there is a very nice flexor reflex visible during gait in the early swing phase while during gait in the, when the stimulus is later in the step cycle, as you can see here, it's closer now to the touchdown, you see that this large response is not present. In fact, there is uh, more of a suppression of the activity. There is uh, evidence for some suppression. And this is when what is happening in the late swing. So what we've seen in the animal literature is also seen in the human literature, uh, again illustrating the parallel in the control of animals uh, and humans. To make the point even clearer, I have the two types of evidence uh, next to each other. This is from the animal literature, the large flexor reflex and the absence of a reflex uh, near the end of the, the swing phase, in the late swing phase. And here is the human data showing uh, basically the same type of result. I want to now go to the beginning of the talk again where I made the point that for the tripping responses there are two basic responses possible, the long step and the short step. And I would like to make the point that in fact this is what you see in tripping. And uh, Something similar was seen when you uh, analyzed the data for the obstacle avoidance. And now I have put all these data next to each other to make the point that the reason for the, uh, these different behaviors may be related to the functioning of the CPG and maybe other structures. Uh, again, uh, making sure that in the early swing phase, when you are about to flex the limb, that this uh, flexion is indeed occurring and this is the long step strategy while at the late swing phase uh, the flexion extra flexion now would be a disaster if you are about to put your foot down it makes more sense to put the foot down first a little bit and then step over the obstacle and that is the short step strategy as i explained earlier so uh, our data then show that even in stumbling and obstacle avoidance, the same processes operate that we have seen uh, in, in animals and that probably are related to how the neural control of gait is organized. There's another point of importance in these uh, studies though, that is that the reactions that you see during the uh, stumbling, during tripping, uh, these reactions that you see here uh, illustrated uh, using an accelerometer put on the on the leg what you see is that these reactions have a very short latency or relatively short latency uh, this is uh, in milliseconds the time is in milliseconds so you can see that the first reactions occur at around 120 milliseconds so why is this important well normally if uh, you have a stimulus le let's see uh, let's say uh, a light that's coming on and you have to react to that, then the simple reaction time takes at least 150 milliseconds. So a voluntary reaction takes about 150 milliseconds. These reactions are shorter, illustrating thereby that these reactions uh, are not conscious voluntary reactions. The brain is doing this uh, for you without it being a conscious action. And this is illustrated also by the fact that if we then in these stumbling experiments ask the subjects uh, what they had done afterwards, whether they could tell they had short step or a long step, they just didn't know. So it's, it's not a, a conscious voluntary decision type process. It is something that the brain uh, takes care of without it uh, requiring a voluntary uh, conscious control. 
On the other hand, these reactions with 120 millisecond latency are, uh, are too late to be spinal cord reactions. So in the human, there seems to be a mixture of spinal cord actions and higher centers uh, like cortex playing a role. Let me make first the point that they are too short to be conscious. This is a plot uh, comparing the latencies of these short and these long uh, steps, as I illustrated before, compared to the latencies that you see in voluntary reactions. And you see they're way below, the, these are way below these voluntary reactions. So, since they are too long also to be just uh, spinal, the idea is that uh, probably the reactions we see in the stumbling and in obstacle avoidance uh, occur through what is called the transcortical type reflex. That is, the actions uh, give rise to uh, activations of a part of the cortex, but there is no, uh, no activation necessarily of the zones of the cortex that provide you with consciousness. So there is a very fast pathway to the cortex and very fast pathway from the cortex to the spinal cord, causing what is called the transcortical reflex. That's the basic idea uh, that people have these days. And uh, to show that it really is uh, involving the cortex, uh, we can do experiments that I want to describe now in this final part of the talk, which are experiments in which you test the idea that the cortex uh, is essential for these reactions uh, and, and showing that by having at the same time uh, a second task. Let me explain this a bit better. What you do is in fact combining two tasks and one of the tasks you are certain that it requires the cortex. So if you now combine the other task that you don't know whether it's cortical or not, with this cortical task, then the idea is if they involve the same structures, if they involve the same area of cortex like shown here, then what one should see is that uh, only one of the tasks can be performed normally and the other one will suffer, or maybe they will both be less good than, uh, norm than would normally occur. So, which task do we use for this type of experiments? We uh, have a task which is called the auditory Stroop task. And what is it? It is a task that uh, you can combine with stumbling, tripping and uh, other, uh, other walking tasks uh, because it's an auditory task in which the task is to uh, listen to a voice, a voice that can say high or it can say low, but it can say so in a high or in a low tone. The pitch can be different. And when it high is said in a high pitch, it's what's called congruent and the answer should be the pitch. So the subjects have to listen to the pitch and they have to say in this case high. When the word high is spoken with a low voice, then the stimulus and the pitch is incongruent and the right answer should be the pitch, so it should be low. So this uh, now uh, requires attention and we know that it involves cortical activation. So the idea is now to have these people, the subjects, uh, perform this task knowing that this will use some of their cortical activity and then uh, have them perform other tasks like stumbling and obstacle avoidance. And the idea is that if these other tasks like stumbling require uh, the, uh, the cortical activity, then there will be more uh, failures. It will, the task will not be performed so well because the same type of cortex has to do two things at the same time now. This is now here an example of uh, data from this, exp this type of experiments where the subjects had to avoid uh, this obstacle that is dropped on the, uh, on the treadmill and it's dropped in various phases of the, uh, of the step cycle. It can be dropped in the late stance phase, in the early swing phase, in the mid swing phase. And what is shown here is the amount of 
failures, that is, that people touch the obstacle. The task was that when you see an obstacle, uh, try to avoid it. And these uh, subjects, that the data that is shown here, is from older uh, subjects. Younger subjects can do this task without making uh, errors, even when they have to perform the dual task. But what you see here is an interesting result, I think, that is that in the elderly, uh, it's much more difficult to combine these tasks and what you see is that the number of failures, so the errors, uh, increases dramatically, not only when they have to do only the obstacle avoidance task, but even much more uh, when the task uh, of obstacle avoidance is combined with a dual task, the auditory troop task in this case. And what this shows is two things. First, uh, it shows that yes, for the uh, for this type of tasks, the spinal cord can do some of it, but uh, it's clear that also the cortex is involved because the there is interference, as it's called. There is interaction uh, when the two tasks are combined. And secondly, there is the difference between the young and the old. Uh, this uh, figure clearly shows that this uh, involvement of the cortex is even more important as you grow older, uh, so you need to pay more attention, uh, is another way of saying the same thing. It's Time is too short to go into detail, detail in, in work of the last years, but let me just summarize the fact that we have done many types of, uh, of tasks, uh, of complex gates, where people have to uh, precisely step on targets, or they have to avoid certain targets, or they have to step on uh, on, on a target that uh, that that shifts at the last minute when they start uh, lowering the foot. Uh, this type of task, and we have done this in young people and in elderly, and the outcome is the same as what I just described above. That is, in all these cases, we see that the elderly have much more problems uh, make, making the combination of these two tasks. So we are pretty sure that the cortical involvement is uh, increasingly important for the elderly as compared to the young. And uh, this is certainly a conclusion that is supported by many data, many types of complex gait require the attention in the elderly. So this may be a lesson to remember, that is that uh, the, this, uh, same, this, uh, this seemingly uh, automatic tests are not so automatic anymore once you are old as I am. So, uh, and in, in the very fast, in the very last portion here of the talk, I like to state that this cortical involvement has another side of it, and that is, it, it may, in, in a sense, be uh, good news in that the cortex is involved, in that it may, uh, it may provide a clue as to what one can do uh, to prevent falls. Let me explain this. This uh, first uh, picture here shows you data uh, from older and younger subjects that are stumbling, that are tripping. And what you see here is the activity of a muscle that is very much involved in these reactions, it's the biceps femoris. And these reactions occur at the latency of 80 to 150 milliseconds. So again, this is a latency that's not in the range of the voluntary uh, movement control. It's probably a transcortical uh, reflex. And uh, the point that is made in the figure is that there is a difference in these responses when we compare the young versus the old. The elderly is the thick line, the thin line is the young, and what you basically see here is that the reactions are similar, they have, uh, they uh, they have a similar shape, general shape, but there is clearly a difference in that the uh, young people have much larger responses, and the responses occur also slightly earlier than in the older subjects. Now, the conclusion can be, in this case, if this is uh, true, then maybe these elderly people have to uh, exercise so that the, the EMG activity, that the contractions of the muscle become 
uh, become larger. But uh, there is also another aspect to be highlighted, and that is the fact that it may perhaps be not possible to change much of this activity in the early phase, but we should not only focus on the early responses, because when we look at the contractions of these muscles, we see that there is also a late activation. This is 100 milliseconds, so you see uh, there is a, a whole period. This fall takes about 700 milliseconds, so it's uh, all the way up here. So you see there is a lot of uh, time here where the, the, there are responses, and these are responses that could be voluntarily controlled. And that is a very important point because when you say that it is voluntary controlled it means that you can uh, train people to make a voluntary change in the behavior and this is uh, a lesson we have taken to heart because uh, we have uh, taken one step further and said if this is the case then it should be possible to train elderly uh, to fall more properly to fall more safely and this is from a video showing how we train uh, in the Netherlands elderly subjects to fall uh, with a technique that is borrowed from the martial arts from judo uh, and the basis of this technique is that you have to try to fall uh, with a reduction of impact and you can do that by uh, spreading out the impact both over the space, over uh, spread this impact over your whole, whole arm and in time because you try to roll off instead of having a very abrupt uh, impact you have a roll off which uh, uh, spreads the impact over time. We have uh, published this material and we have uh, found that a five week period of martial arts can reduce falls uh, up to 46 <coughs> percent so there is I think some hope the difficulty is that uh, the to be effective uh, this type of training should be repeated uh, because of course uh, like in many cases uh, something that you have learned you have to keep training uh, to be sure that it that you that you maintain the learning level let me come to the end of the talk here uh, with some summary and conclusion slide. Uh, what have we learned in the webinar, I hope, is that uh, it is certainly true that simple gates is largely an automated motor act and that it depends on the spinal cord uh, reflexes and on the central pattern generators. And <coughs> the evidence is such that uh, we can state that this is also presumably true in humans. What we also learned, and this is more controversial, is that the central part of these generators is really the swing generator, the flexor burst generator as I called it, uh, which is more important than the extensor generator burst because it is the swing phase uh, that is controlling, basically controlling the gate and it is <coughs> the uh, rhythm generator that controls this, uh, th this part of the generator and the uh, swing generator or the flexor burst generator facilitates um, the flexor responses. There is a, a large similarity in the flexor reflex and in the, swing, in the flexor part of the swing phase. Then uh, we have turned attention to the more complex forms of gait, obstacle avoidance, tripping and so on. And uh, we found that there is some evidence that the spinal cord may control some of these reactions so that they are different depending on the phase of the step cycle. But we also made the point that in humans, uh, the, there is an increasingly important role of the cortex and there is an increasingly important role especially in the elderly <coughs> because the role of the cortex becomes more important as one grows older and uh, it means that distraction during these tasks of gait, complex forms of gait uh, can be dangerous and one should take that into account when working with the elderly. And then finally the, um, the fact that the cortex is, is involved in these tasks of uh, obstacle avoidance and in tripping uh, reactions also uh, offers the opportunity 
uh, for learning. Uh, since we can voluntarily change the way we fall, it should be part of uh, the fall prevention uh, education that uh, people uh, also learn that when it's, un when it's not possible to avoid a fall, that at least they should try to fall as safely as possible. And this can be done by safely applying what is called martial arts techniques. So this is what I had to tell you in this webinar and I like to show you the, some of these pictures of the uh, elderly training.